Great. Hi, anyone who is joining on recording. Um, I'm going to dive straight in and we will do introductions and the like there. Um, if you have any questions, stick them in the chat. I will periodically check back. Um, and yeah, just, just ask away. I'll give you some opportunities to chat to me later on as well. If there's any questions that you feel maybe uncomfortable about sharing in, in the group, you can also um, send messages directly to me. Um, but yeah, we are going to whiz through this because there's a lot to get through in a very short space of time. So here we go. Can everyone see my screen, which is currently on? Oh, sorry. Like I said, I'm a bit of a, I'm a Google girly, so Zoom is a bit alien to me. All right, here we go. Can everyone see my my uh, deck with my my new headshots taken at Candid Studio, which I highly recommend if anyone uh, needs headshots. Also, hi Brad and little Brad. <laughs> This is a, oh, our baby Brad's in a photo. Never mind. I thought that we had a little tiny person joining us today and productivity thinking, but here we go. Okay, cool. Nicole, woo candid. Yes, Nicole's had her headshots done at Candid as well. Highly recommend female-owned business in, in Notting Hill. So a little plug for them. We love to support the, the female founder businesses. So thank you everyone for coming today is the Sustainable Productivity Toolkit for Very Busy People. This is my kind of bread and butter flagship presentation. Um, like I said, I've trimmed it down a little bit but so to fit the time I try to do this usually in an hour and a half. We've got a little bit less time today and I wanna leave time for people to ask questions and things. So I'm gonna go through really, really quickly. I speak fast. This is a, you know, take notes kind of situation. It's slightly more of a lecture than, a, than an interactive one, but it's just because I wanna get as much of this through as possible. Um, a lot of my other workshops are much more back and forth um, so that you can ask, you know, more detailed questions, but this is just, I want to get as much to you as possible. So let's get started, but I can see the chat up here. Ask me anything as you go along and yeah, we'll get started. So today we're going to cover the essential concepts of sustainable productivity and what sustainable productivity is, because you might be like, sounds like something, but don't really know. Key productivity tools, tips, and systems, the power of work breaks and why you can't control it all, which I think is a super important thing. It's going to be around 45 minutes and there'll be an optional Q&A at the end. You're more than welcome to stay. I'm sticking around till 11. So you can ask me anything that you want from there. Okay. I don't share my slides just to make sure that people don't nab them, but you are more than welcome to take any um, little screenshots or things to for your reference. That's absolutely fine. Okay, so about me, um, this is me. These are my two dogs. Actually, sadly, Chester is no longer with us, which is really sad, but this is a lockdown photo. Um, my co-founder makes my slides because I make slides hideously. Um, and he says that this makes me more memorable and hopefully people <laughs> will remember me when they think about booking people for workshops. So that's why that's there. Um, this is Reggie. He is quite famous on Instagram <laughs> like he doesn't have his own account but he's famous through my one so some of you may know him he's a real character um that very much disrupts my productivity so I would say that I'm a productivity person in that I find it very interesting and that I'm really fascinated in trying to figure out how to get the most things done with the least amount of impact on the other things that I want to do and we'll go into that um in detail later but I'm certainly not always a productive person that I think is really important, <clears throat> excuse me, because I think sometimes people come into these things thinking, oh, well, you're someone who's like naturally switched on or whatever, like, you know, how are you going to tell us these things? But let me tell you, if you knew me in school, you would be like, I don't know how you're here now. I'm sure there are some like friends from school who are like, what are you doing telling people this? Because I was so scatty, so unproductive just not, I was not the one. So really important up top to tell you that this is stuff that I've learned along the way. So I'm a believer in better work days. I have worked for some amazing companies. I've worked for some truly awful companies. I've worked for myself. Um, and I think that I have seen the gamut really in, in different ways of working. I think it's also really important to let you know, short story, but a short version of a very long story up top. Um, I have a visual impairment. I got it when I was, it developed, came along when I was 18. I was in my first term at Cambridge and I just had allergic reaction to some medicine, went blind for about a month. Um, and I have a visual impairment now that I've had for 11 years this week, which is wild. I actually can't believe that it's that long. Um, so, oh my God, 11 years this week. So 
I went back to uni like straight away. Um, 18 year olds thinking they can do everything. Went back to uni as soon as that, as soon as I wasn't blind. And sorry, oh, we've got another entrance. Um, and I had to learn a lot of these things a very hard way. So I was upskilling, not only going from a very scatty person at school going into Cambridge, I was also upskilling being a fully able-bodied person who used to be able to read a book in a day, no bother, to really struggling to even make it through a poem. I was also doing English. It was so inconvenient. Um, so a bit of context up top for how we got here. Um, can everyone just make sure they're on mute, please, as well, just because um, I don't want to disrupt any background noise. So another thing is that I really don't believe in busyness, um, despite the fact that I am someone who frequently finds myself in a state of like tumbling through and feeling really busy. I don't believe that busyness is the best way to work. So we'll talk about some of those things there. Um, and obviously, quite obviously a dog person. Again, my co-founder makes these slides. He put dog person and then was like, I don't want to alienate the cat people. And you also love cats. So I'm going to put that there as well. And I'm like, fine, leave it. <laughs> Everyone is welcome here. So I would love to see you sharing any learnings that you have from today. So these top two, are how you can find me on Instagram, just a, a, a little thing. Our interlude account is quite quiet at the moment as we're rebranding, which is really exciting. So um, a little bit quiet on there, but please do share anything that you learn. Um, this is how we, I don't spend anything on marketing at all. So how we book um, workshops is purely through word of mouth. So please do share it on, um, on Instagram. And I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn because there are very few Caitlin Rosarios in the world. So yeah, share away. Um, even though I don't look my best, I don't mind you sharing. Um, okay. I'll leave those for just a second so you can all write them down. Okay. We move on. So I often take this out actually when I do, um, cause I do business, I do workshops to businesses and to, um, individuals like yourselves. And I actually often take this out when I do it to businesses, because I think one of the things is that people find productivity a really icky word and it is a really icky word. It has been made to be a really horrible, toxic thing, but I'm trying to do this in a reclaiming kind of way. Like productivity isn't inherently a bad thing we have made it a bad thing and we'll talk about that in a bit but I would love to like to go back a tiny bit when we started interlude myself and my co-founder who's also my partner so that tells you even more about how how we've been going around this we were thinking about how people seem to fall too often on two sides of an unproductivity spectrum that we would rather all be off um and so I would love to know at the moment and I'm sure this really fluctuates because it does for me where are you feeling on this? Are you feeling more on the, you can use um, words here. So are you feeling more unfocused? Are you feeling more unmotivated? Or you're on the other side, are you feeling too productive, like a bit frazzled and hectic, are you a bit overworked? Personally, I'm very much in this overworked side at the moment. Um, so if you just drop in the chat how you're feeling, or if anyone wants to shout out, that's also fine. Um, I'll just have a look. This photo is incredible. Thank I actually won a puppy yoga competition. I won tickets to a puppy yoga competition with that photo. That's why I feel like it's quite good luck. Um, I actually, probably in the middle. Yep, cool. Um, I hosted a, a workshop last week. And one of the things that we talked about was what our, tr our, our warning signs are of when we're falling into chaos. And um, one of mine that I wrote down was that I start messing dates up and I start double booking myself and then getting sick and then getting injured. And all of those things happened to me this week. And I was like, oh, I need to listen to myself. Um, somewhere in the middle, only since working remote for the last week, last week was more chaos leaning. Yep. Taz is more on the hectic end. I'm not surprised it's the end of the year. Antonia, too productive. Then burnout. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like you. Yes, I completely get that. Yeah. Okay, Matthew, feeling more, oh, we've got, sorry, we've got another person joining. Sorry, let me just make sure that I can get to them, Dan. There we go. Um, so yeah, I completely, completely feel you on that. Sorry, I've just lost that there. Um, okay, cool. So it does seem like people are more on this side, but then are seeing like when that happens, they go into that, completely get it. It's it's a, a vicious cycle. We talk about this a lot in, in some of our other workshops of how it's, when you get into a good cycle, it's, it's hard to keep up but when you get into a vicious cycle it's really easy to fall down it and it's just so unfair that that's the the, the way that our brains lean that negativity bias okay part one productivity we are gonna whiz through this so 
Does anyone have an idea of what the difference between productivity proper and perceived productivity might be? And I'm going to take a sip of tea while I wait for someone to say what they think it might be. I feel like I may have lost my Zoom. There it is. Sorry, I've lost my, I've lost my chat function. Has anyone messaged in the chat just verbally? Because otherwise, because I've lost how to see it when I let someone in. No. Um, I think it was hidden in the more bit at the bottom. Yeah, I actually can't get that up now, which is really annoying. Um, Taz, will you just every, every now and then when I pause, will you just shout out any questions that we've had, please? Um, and then I can. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Then we can just crack on. Um, so I'll just roll on with this. So productivity proper is the way that the majority of us used to work. So think like factories, for example. So this is when. It used to be uh, Hoover got up. So Antonia makes three bikes. I make two bikes. Antonia is objectively more productive. Antonia is objectively created more things. And that used to be how work used to be for a lot of us. It was, you know, plowing farms and harvesting things and building stuff and manufacturing things. And that was the way most people worked. Perceived productivity is much more to do with knowledge work, which is how so many of us work now. So working at a desk, thinking, you know, doing things that aren't so linear. So let's say that um, I write two blog posts and Kieran writes four, four blog posts. That doesn't necessarily mean that Kieran has been more productive because perhaps Kieran had all the notes ready for those. Perhaps Kieran knew loads about those things. Whereas I had to do loads of research and it took a lot longer. And the ones that I produced were were ha had a higher word count and things like that. So perceived productivity is much more nuanced. And the thing that also becomes really tricky with perceived productivity is like if you're working in a team, particularly, so I'll, I'll kind of bop between um, things between like founders and entrepreneurs and then working in a team for this. So if you're working in a team, for example, your perceived productivity is not only about how you think about your work, it's about how your manager thinks about your work, how your manager thinks about the rest of the team's work in relation to your work and vice versa, and how your team members think about their work in relation to your work. And all of that comes into play. And it, there is really no good way of measuring it. There's all sorts of different things that science has like developed, but there is no foolproof way of measuring perceived productivity which is what makes it really difficult to work with so no kind of answers on this it's just something to bear in mind as we go through this is really what we're dealing with here's the thing though productivity is in crisis and it has been for a while so we may be feeling oh you know post lockdowns um in a financial crisis productivity is down you know people aren't getting pay rises funding isn't coming through things like that spending power is low but actually a not very fun fact is that Britain's productivity growth was the worst in the 2010s than it had been since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So we have been like this for a long time. And actually, economists are so confused by this. If anyone's ever done like an economics degree or has read about it, you may have heard of this. But um, economists call it the productivity puzzle because they can't figure out why we're in this. And obviously, if economists can't figure it out, I certainly can't. But I do think that a factor in it has to be our just awful working attitude in the UK. Like we have such a an aggressive first in, last out kind of ways of ways of working. And there's a lot of companies that are doing really good work to challenge this. But I've spoken to so many people in HR and workplace wellbeing and things like that. And I think that there's a very big trickle down from finance and legal that really um that really like dominates our work culture. And I think that has a big trickle down for the rest of us. So if you're thinking I'm just having a bit of a bad time at the moment, it, as a country, we've been bad for a long time um, and it's obviously only getting worse. I have actually emailed the professors who did this to say, have you seen any difference since um, Brexit, lockdown, financial crisis? But they haven't replied to me and I haven't been able to find anything. So we'll see. Um, my chat has come back. Amazing. OK, great. Just in time. So do you think the rise in technology... We're going to get to that, actually. That is a, a thing we're going to come to, Lauren. And it, I, I don't see how it can't have. I don't see how technology can't have affected our focus and attention and things like that. But I also think that while there's, indiv and this is actually a point to say, so this is about individual things. There's also the big kind of like macro environment and macroeconomic factors. Um, 
all of those come together. Um, it's also worth me mentioning that a lot of the stuff I focus on with Interlude is individual individual um, strategies, even though I do very strongly believe that the the cures and how we change things come from the top and they are systemic. But I also believe in autonomy and saying like, okay, in the meantime, while we're waiting for and we're pushing for change, what can we do individually to make things better? So should have mentioned that up top. I really think that change needs to come from governments, businesses, bosses, things like that. Okay, so quick pop quiz and we're going to I'm going to open a loop and then we'll close the loop later. So you can just drop it in the in the chat. How many hours a day do you think that the average UK worker is productive for? So a few things here. A day, people often think a week and they'll be like 40. (laughs) I'm like, no, this is a day. Um, This is knowledge workers. So people who work at desks. um, And this is also self-reported. So they're the kind of, they're the things around this. So I'll let you just drop some thoughts in here. Two, three, five, four, (laughs) three. (laughs) That felt like it was coming from you, from your heart, Nicole. Two hours at a time. Interesting. Super interesting. Nice. Okay, cool. Some great, great suggestions. Also, I find it so interesting with like every workshop that I do, there's, depending on the people who are there, like when it's, when I do this to founders, it's like 14. (laughs) When I do it to people who work in businesses, I think there's more people see the kind of spectrum of work a lot better, um, which I think is super interesting. Okay, we're gonna come back to it. Thank you for your suggestions. So what you can do about this in a working world that really far too often finds itself in peaks and troughs of unsustainable productivity, we really wanna help people to find sustainable productivity. So finally, what is it? What are you talking about? What are these buzzwords that you've just made up? So we define sustainable productivity as a company as achieving your goals, feeling great while doing it and having more time and energy to do the things you love. That last bit, I think, is the most important thing because we think of it so often as a when I have time situation, but we don't think about how important that last bit of like having time and energy for the things you love actually affects our work. And when we neglect the bit at the bottom, the having time and energy for the things that we love and putting, you know, actually showing up and being present for it, If we don't do that, our work is affected and we think it has nothing to do with it, but actually it has everything to do with it. Um, And it's, it is just so important. It is so important that we make time for those things, but it's that cycle. So we really want to help people to, we used to actually, an interesting thing, we used to define this as getting things done and feeling great while doing it. But actually the more I've worked on this, I've been doing this for nearly four years now. I don't think productivity is about getting things done. I think it's about achieving your goals and sometimes achieving your goals requires a lot of time of not getting things done it requires a lot of time of rest a lot of time of thinking and reflection and all the things that actually are nothing to do with your active work so that's how things have changed I think it's really important to be open about how you um change your thinking over time as well so that's what we define sustainable productivity as we want you to feel good while you're doing it so essentially less of this and more of this and I think why this is super important to just show this really basic um canva thing that I made is because the the troughs are going to happen. Things are going to happen in life. Like I woke up this Monday being like, this is my week. Like this is the week that I'm going to, I had so many exciting things in. I was really, really like, oh, I'm, this is it. Like this is going to be one of those weeks where I'm going to come out the other end. Like, ah. And then I tweaked my back on Tuesday and I came down with this cold and nothing has happened this week. It has been a disgusting week physically so the trough has happened and I think before I would have been like oh I need to just push through and my trough would have become one of these whereas yesterday like there are a few things I had to do like I wanted to show up for this so I made sure that yesterday was a much quieter day um and I will not be doing very much with my day after this one so it's really important to just recognize when the the troughs are here ride them out and then hopefully they are much less aggressive and then hopefully your peaks I want them to come but I want them to be more prolonged and I want them to last for longer um I don't think that these aggressive like intense peaks are worth the dip and I'm sure anyone here who's experienced burnout or any sort of like mental health issue related to work I'm sure you'll all agree that that isn't just not worth it okay so two states of work that we need to be in getting through stuff and deep work and flow. So I'm not gonna get too into this because I've got a whole other workshops on this. There's a lot of people who've done a lot of work on this, but I think it's really important just to think about whenever you're doing things, 
which of these states do you need to be in? And there are different strategies and tactics for different things. So the pop quiz. I think actually a lot of you are really close on this. Let's have a look. Nicole, Lauren, Matthew, I think the closest. So around two hours and 53 minutes is what came out of this study. Um, This was a big sample size, about 2,600 people. Again, self-reported. Methodology leaves a little bit to to be desired, but I think it's a really interesting thing. And I think what's super interesting is they had to report what they were doing in the time that they weren't productive. And a lot of it was like doom scrolling, like looking at the news, which is essentially doom scrolling, really, let's be honest. Um, And a lot of things that felt like they weren't making people happy. Like, it's like, do you really enjoy yourself while you're doing it? So for example, like scrolling through social media, I love social media. I'm such an Instagram basic millennial. Like I love it so much. And I have no problem with looking at social media. I think it's about being intentional and saying like, oh, I'm going to spend 10 minutes doing this now, et cetera, et cetera. But what I think is also interesting about this two things. They didn't self-report busy work. So busy work is work about work that really isn't getting you anywhere, but you're just pretending to yourself and others that you're doing stuff. That wasn't on there because the um, options were were pre-selected by the researchers. So they didn't get to self-report their, what they were doing. So again, methodology, a little bit iffy. Um, so I'd like to see this, you know, repeated on a bigger scale, but equally when I'm using this to speak to business owners, it's like, okay, if people are only working for three hours a day, let's just take that as gospel, three productive hours a day. How can we use that blank space in better ways? And that's what a lot of the the stuff that we talk about is about. So if you feel like you only have a few productive hours a day, you're not alone. There's lots of people who feel like that as well. Okay. Productivity tools. This is the meat of it. So I'm going to really talk fast in these ones, try to get through as much as we can in the time that we have. So a disclaimer, the tools here will not work for everyone. I don't expect them to. Everyone's brains works differently. There's, you know, different things for different people, but I also really wouldn't recommend that you, even if you're like, oh, I've never heard of any of these and I really want to try them all out. Please don't try them all out at once. Take it a bit of a, t- a bit at a time. Take one, try it for a week or so, maybe even longer, like even, you know, a month would be better to try and like get into it. Um, I've built up using these over about three years. Um, so it's, it really is a slow and steady, but I want to give them all to you so that you have ideas of them. So finding the best results and building a toolkit and using a toolkit that works is really down to you. Got it. Great. I don't want it. I've had questions before where people are like, when does this become toxic? Like having so many things, it's like, well, you shouldn't be using all of them. <laughs> like you, this is about finding what works for you. So first stop planning my favorite thing in the world to do. But the more time you spend contemplating what you should have done, you lose valuable time planning what you can and will do. Anyone, any thoughts on which big thinker may have said this? People often say like Cicero. It was in fact Lil Wayne. Obviously a very productive person. So worth listening to. Before we crack on with them, a really um, important concept that I hope some people have heard of, but if you haven't, you're going to know. Parkinson's law. It's the idea that work expands to fill an allotted time. And I always think about like homework at school, like, you know, when you got the homework and you had those friends who did it the day they got it and you were like, I'm I'm not going to do it today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. But you never did it tomorrow. You did it right before it was due. That is Parkinson's law in action. Um, I think it's really important just to bear this one in mind. It really underpins a lot of the things we're going to talk about. So work will expand to fill the allotted time. Keep that in mind. Okay, the to-do table. Now, I know that Taz has definitely heard of this because I know Rachel is a big fan of Grace Beverly. Um, Rachel and I have something in common that we both bought the planners for our teams. So um, you can tell I'm a really big fan of this. So when I first started using the to-do table, which I'll explain in just a moment, it really really helped me it it was one of those things that I tried and it just clicked straight away so how do you use it It, with the to-do table you split your tasks into quick ticks so five minutes um tasks 30 minutes or less and projects so 30 plus minutes and obviously the idea is that you break your projects the big ones into smaller tasks and ticks so when can you do this you could do this for the week and then for each day if you wanted to you could do it um monthly it depends how your brain works everything here i've tried to give the the highest level version so that you can find what works for you 
But why does it work? So it gives you a better view of what's on your plate and what you can achieve with your time and energy. And why I really love this is I find it super helpful. I actually don't have mine with me at the moment. It's downstairs, but I will show you something in a moment. It really helps for when, say something is cancelled, you've got an hour meeting that's cancelled. You can really quickly, instead of being like, oh, what should I do with it? You can look at your to-do table and you can be like, oh, I'm going to do two of these tasks or I'm going to do five quick ticks or I'm going to do an hour of one project. And I found that so helpful because I have two jobs. I work in a startup. I run the Brown and Comms team in a startup and I also have my own startup. So it's just a lot of changing stuff all the time. And this helps to really keep my head in the game. So Grace Beverly, who, if you don't know her, is an extremely productive person, um, owns like three companies now, I think, um, including her own personal brand. So, you know, this is someone who's got a lot on their plate. I think this is a really, a really good point here, which is all your tasks are not the same. They're not of equal priority. And it's, this is going to build on the next thing we're going to talk about, but it's really helpful to be able to have this split first before you then start thinking about priority levels as well. So what might it look like? So you could so before actually I, I will show this to you I've got a, a slide for you before I used to do this just like I literally just had a pen and paper and this is another point everything that I try to share you don't have to buy anything for you can do but you don't have to I try to make everything as accessible as possible and I used to just do this with a pen and paper every week so quick ticks for example like reply to an email a task might be updating zero as Taz will probably be happy to hear and then uh, projects like building out a new category for our um for our work so just thinking about those things in bigger blocks any questions on this before I move on because I'm going to each thing builds on the next one so you'll hear a bit more about it but if you have any questions pop it in the chat cool okay so next is to think about you've got your things broken out by time. Now we're going to think about priority. So the Eisenhower matrix. Has anyone heard of this? Anyone know about the Eisenhower matrix? In the chat. Yes. Okay. Nice. So the Eisenhower matrix is really, really helpful. I find it really helpful. Again, this isn't going to be for everyone, but I find it super, super helpful. Um, so what you do, you break into a box with four quadrants and I will just actually skip to the next slide and then I'll come back to this one. So it looks like this. You've got your urgent and important, your not urgent and important, your urgent and not important, and your not urgent and not important. So many words, easier to think of it as do. So the things that you're just gonna crack on and get them done now. If it's not urgent, but it is important, you're gonna decide when to, when to do it. Um, and this will build on the next thing we talk about, but it's like thinking about, not just, oh, I'm going to do it later. It's like, when are you going to do it? When does that need to be done? Urgent, but not important. So delegate. And this doesn't necessarily mean like, you might be someone who is a bit more junior or whatever. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to tell Taz to do it. It's like, maybe go and speak to your manager and say, I've done a bit of prioritizing and it, I know this needs to be done quickly, but I've got some urgent and important things to do. So would there be someone else on the team who could help with this? So it's not always about you doing the delegating, but it's a tool to help you help someone else do the delegating perhaps. Um, and if you work for yourself, then it's about delegating to future you in terms of like these two become a little bit more linked. It's like, okay, when when can future me do this that's urgent? Whereas this one's kind of not urgent. And then delete is like, you don't have to delete it forever. I actually have a backlog list where I just put my delete things where I'm like, I can come to that when I've got a bit of time where I'm like, eh, maybe I don't want to do anything that's particularly pressing. Um, I've got the pressing things done. I want to reorganize my bookshelf because it'll make me feel a little bit happier and make my room feel a bit nicer. So it doesn't have to be delete forever, but sometimes things do get deleted forever and that's okay as well. We'll come back to that. So I'm just going to go back to this slide. So why is this helpful? There will be times, and this was me this week, when everything feels urgent and important. And this is a really quick method. So I literally do this on a, on a sheet, scratch it out. Um, this can help you to organize your workload and your priorities to get things in order and can really help, like I said, to communicate capacity issues to a manager. Um, and psychologists have said that this can be particularly useful if you have ADHD. And between us, I'm actually thinking about getting um, tested because I think I almost certainly have ADHD. And I find this super, super, super helpful. Now, some people use this really um, diligently. And in fact, in my team, in my day job, when we do our weekly planning, we have a column on, we use ClickUp, but you can use any sort of like, if you use any tool, you can do this, like Asana, Monday, those sorts of things. We have a custom column that has these on it. 
So urgent, not important, not urgent, blah, blah, blah. And it means that we can filter tasks by those things, um, which is a super helpful way of using it. So you can do it all the time or you can do it like I do, which is in crunch time. So I think that's because, sorry for the um, little Gmail noise there. Um, I've used this so much that I do it instinctively in my head when I'm planning, I think. So you might want to, if you think this sounds useful, you might want to start with this um but equally you may use it the way I do which is when you're like oh my god I'm starting to feel whatever your trigger feelings are like feeling really overwhelmed you might think right I'm going to take my list and I'm just going to really quickly a four piece of paper write this out so I'll put it here again so you can um screenshot it or whatever you'd like to do write this out put everything into it start with the urgent and important great get those ones done Deal with your not urgent and important ones. Like, when are you going to do them? Then you're going to crack on with the urgent and not important ones. If you, either you're going to delegate them to yourself to get them done, or you're going to ask someone else to help them. And then the delete ones, you can be like, I'm not even going to think about those right now. So really, really, really helps. And sometimes what I do is I'm like, I'm not going to do anything except for urgent and important. And once they're done, we'll see where we're at. But I tell myself, I give myself that like grace of these are the only things that matter right now. So just to finish this off, um, this is actually interestingly attributed to Dwight Eisenhower, the 34th president of the United States, but actually he didn't say he didn't think of this, his college professor did. Um, but you know, whatever, that's the way things go, isn't it? People, some people get the credit for everything. Um, but he did say, What is what is important is seldom urgent, and what is urgent is seldom important. And I do feel like that hits quite deep a lot of the time. Um, just something in the chat. What do you recommend for delegating if you're a one woman show? Yeah, really. I do think at this point, Lauren, this is when these two become a bit closer, but equally a very wise man called Joe Binder, Nicole, you know him well, told me that, gave me this idea of a, of, um, a three star scale. So look at all your tasks and three stars is only you can do it. Two stars is you could train someone else to do it. And one star is anyone can do it. And he was saying, like, if you think about how valuable your time is, your money becomes more, makes more sense when you're like, okay, I have all these three star tasks that only I can do, but I also have a few like one star tasks that anyone could do. Could you spend 50 quid on Fiverr to get those things off your plate? And when he told me that, I was like, no, I have to do everything. And then he was like, right, let's look at your list. And was like, here are 20 things that literally anyone could do. So sometimes you have to get your ego out of the way as well. Um, shout out to Joe Binder. Yeah smart guy very smart guy so I think Lauren that really helped my thinking like I outsourced some um like lead scoring stuff uh on on Fiverr the other day um and it's yeah soup I found it so so helpful so not taking any credit for that three star system that's all Joe um but a really really helpful system so it is very different depending on how your work is but yeah hopefully that helped okay yes we're doing okay next one time boxing okay I live and die by time boxing. It's I'm obsessed with it. And I didn't start doing this until I was maybe 24, I think. So again, not something I've spent my whole life doing. I remember my manager actually saying to me, she's like, um, do you think it would be helpful if we sat together and like looked at your calendar and planned out when you were going to do things? Because she's like, you always get things done but to your own detriment where you're like, oh no, now I have to do everything at like this time because you haven't like planned them in properly. And that was such a turning point for me. So it's definitely hard one <laughs> for this. I'm not a naturally organized person and I certainly haven't been doing this for my whole life. So what is time boxing? It's a very, very, very effective time management technique that usually involves planning your day by blocking specific tasks, usually into an online calendar. Some people do it written. I really recommend online because it means you can move things around more. This doesn't work for everyone. Some people find this really overwhelming. Um, but I do think that a lot of people say, oh, but that's so much structure. Like I don't like that much rigidity, but actually I felt like that initially. And actually I have found, and many, many people have written about this, that more structure often gives you more flexibility and more freedom because you're able to say, okay, well, if I get this thing done, I have all this time for this other thing that I really want to do. 
Now, something that's really important in thinking about this. So you could do this at the start of each week. You could do it at the beginning of each day. I tend to do it. Um, I plan for fortnights. So on a Friday and Saturday, I do my planning for the following fortnight and I time block things that I know need to be time blocked. And then I time block daily. And that's because I don't want to, because again, I have two very plate spinning kind of jobs. I don't want to box everything out too much, but I do it on the daily. But it also means that when we're doing this delegate piece, when we're doing this delegate and decide piece, especially this decide piece, it means that you can block it for where it needs to be. So you might be like this two hour workshop that I need to work on. I can't do this today. I don't need to do this today because it's not urgent, but I'm going to spend two hours next Tuesday doing it. And you know, you have the time because you've already blocked out any urgent things that need to be done there. And I think that something that's super important that I haven't put here because it's something that I am mulling over, but I think is so important is block the things you want to do in first that are urgent and important to your well-being. So if that's the gym, if that's seeing friends, if it's uh, rest, whatever it is, block those urgent and important things in first. I think that is super, super, super important. Um, so why? Why is it helpful? So time blocking or time boxing, you'll see it different ways, same thing, helps you to really visually organize your time with very clear limits. So it really helps with a sense of accountability, it helps with intention, it helps with control, and it helps with autonomy. Um, and it's also really good, so many people, because I've obviously trained my team at my day job in, in like doing this, and they say it's really helpful for um, looking back when it comes to like reviews and things, because you can look back and see how you spent your time. So it's really helpful to say, look, I, I spent a huge amount of time on this project. This is how it went, blah, blah, blah. Really useful for that because it's you've got like a log of things. You've got a diary, basically. Um, So my tip is to keep it flexible. So in a few different ways. So planning time for urgent, important, but not urgent tasks is really, is really important because those things are the sort of things that like drop off the list, even though we're like, oh, that's important. But you're like all oh, the urgent things, but actually there's going to be a lot of things that are urgent, that are not important that you should be worrying about less. I think about these ones more. So I know people who, um, I don't know if there's anyone in the startup space here, but there's an investor called Mark Cohen who does important, but not urgent Thursdays, which I think is quite a nice way of doing it. Um, there is a, an American couple called um Demir and Carrie Bentley I believe their names are and they have a thing called Life Hackers super American but I love it and they talk about um UUW which is unwanted unexpected work and blocking time for that so I have a a bit of time every day an hour every day that I call admin time but that's my like spillover time where I like I know that there's an hour every day where I can get bits done um, some people block out, say like a week, every fortnight, that sort of thing. So you can, that kind of flexibility is important. The other thing to think about is how you time block. So some people like to block every minute of every day, blocking in their breaks, blocking in their, um, free time, all that sort of thing. Whereas other people prefer to do it where they only block in their, their have to do's. Um, and some people prefer to block in buffer time where people prefer to block specific time. It's completely up to you. But the important thing to remember here is Parkinson's law. So I'm coming back. Parkinson's law. So thinking like, how long is this task actually going to take me? And why I think time, bo time boxing is also really helpful is if you blocked, let's say an hour and a half in to do something and then it took you much longer, you can use that as a record of like, oh, okay, I thought it was going to take an hour and a half, but because of this thing it actually took me two hours. So now I know for future reference that that's how long I need to do a task like this. So there is no one way to do this, um, but it's really important to like play with it a bit and find your way. So Neri Al, I'm not going to get hugely into it because he's a bit of a controversial thinker on this, um, but for something he did say that I think is helpful is if you don't plan your day, your day in advance, according to your values and your schedule, someone else will plan it for you. I think that's really important. Let me just check how we're doing. Okay, cool. So Mark Zao Sanders, who writes for Harvard Business Review, and actually has also written a book that I have contributed a quote to. So um, really, <laughs> my first time my name is going to be in a book. So that's really exciting. Um, I was talking about breaks, obviously, if you don't know interlude, a lot about what we do is about breaks. Um, so he said this, which I think is really um, a helpful summary of why top, uh, time boxing is the productivity greatest of all time tool. So the practice involves how we feel, which is about control, how much we achieve as individuals, which is about personal productivity, and how much we achieve in the teams that we work in, in uh, enhanced collaboration. So I think it's a really nice thing that wraps up that thing that we've been talking about, about the bigger picture and also personal productivity. 
This may be the single most important skill or practice that you can possibly develop as a modern professional as it buys you so much time to accomplish anything else. And that last bit is why I think it's so important. So if you're thinking, I really don't like this idea of like blocking my time out, block the things you love first, because then you'll see like, okay, if I'm going out for dinner with my friends at seven and my travel time is 45 minutes, so that's taking me up to 6.15, I have to get, oh, and then I need to get ready, which takes me half an hour. I have to get everything done in that time. And it makes you think about how much time you have for the things that you need to do so that you can do the things that you love to do, which will make the things you have to do for work better. It it will. So thinking about all of this as a holistic, a holistic, um, I mean, it's life. <laughs> that's it, right? It's about thinking about life as a holistic thing instead of, that's why I hate the phrase work-life balance. They're not, it's, it's work-life mess, you know? So you have to think about them all together. So task four, little tiny one, but really, really helpful task batching. So this is the last tool, by the way, and then we'll wrap it up with a few other things. So task batching is about grouping similar types of work together to keep your brain in one zone. So for example, you could put all your quick ticks into an admin block after lunch. That's exactly what I do. You could be like, oh, I need to do a few like writing tasks. You do those all together and then you do your like thinking tasks separately. Just check a little thing in the chat. Love this idea. Yeah, it's so good. Honestly, when I started doing this, it really helped. Um, so it really helps you to group tasks that require similar time and energy together. Um, a bit of a controversial tip. So if you can, and not everyone can, because it depends on your work, but if you can, only looking at emails twice a day can be really helpful for this. So you're batching emails, because otherwise, if you're checking your emails all the time, your brain is getting distracted and it takes, science tells us that it takes 20 minutes to get back to the state that you were in after you are distracted. So you're wasting huge amounts of time that you're actually using, you're doing stuff in them, but your brain is not where it needs to be. So I really recommend if you can having email blocks. So it doesn't have to be twice a day. Maybe you do it. Maybe you say like, I'm going to check my, I've time blocked my day. And at the, the end of each like deep work batch that I'm doing, that's when I'm going to check my email so that you're, you're, you're in control of the distraction, if that makes sense. So Entrepreneur Magazine put it really nicely that task batching makes it feel like it's one fluid execution rather than mentally jumping back and forth from one type to another. And actually, this is one of my warning signs. I find that when I start doing this mental jumping back and forth, I know I'm avoiding doing the work. So that's something that tells me, OK, I need a bit of a reset. So task batching, really, really helpful. So. Do you practice what you preach? You might be like, I, I hear you. I hear all these things, but maybe you're just a charlatan who makes money off this. No, no, no. It's the other way around. I did all these things and then I thought I can help people. And sometimes people pay me for it. So it's all worked together quite nicely. So this is, um, it's quite an old one. I use an old one because otherwise it's kind of outing myself with what I'm doing right now. Um, but here is my click up board. I have one of these for my day job and I have one of these for my startup. And so everything goes into this. I have a brain dump where everything goes. And then I work in two week sprints. I always work in fortnights because if you work in a fortnight, you're never caught out for the following week. So everything's on here. You can see my co-founder is on here as well. And everything is just brain dumped into here. So that's fortnightly. Then at the beginning of every week, piece of paper, you can see how analog this is. You don't need anything fancy and expensive. I mean, even this free version, you don't have to use the expensive version. Um, I split it into my day job, into interlude and into my life. How sad that the only thing I had in life at the time was making my sisters pay me for our Iceland holiday. <laughs> um, but the holiday was great, so it's fine. So splitting everything in so that I have one overview that I have with me at all times of everything that needs to get done. And what this means is because I have the two separate click up boards, sometimes it feels like they're a bit disparate, but it's nice to have one place where I can see everything, everything all at once. So if something came up where, because I also, in my head, I know which ones are urgent and important, right? If an interlude meeting was cancelled and I had no urgent and important interlude stuff, I could do an urgent and important thing for my day job because everything's in one place and I can see it all there and I can see how long it's going to take me. So again, this doesn't work for everyone. I have a very specific way of working, but it might help you. And I just want to obviously show you that I'm like the real deal and I'm not just making up. Um, so fortnightly, I do this one weekly. And then daily, I have my productivity planner. Again, you don't have to pay for this. For a long time, I just did this in my notebook. I just did the quick ticks, the tasks, the projects. Just saves me a bit of time having having this done. This is um, Grace Beverly's The Productivity Method. Just Google that. They have them. 
um, that often sold out though. So I tend to buy a few at once, just a top tip. Um, so I do this for my day and that's how, so I can see everything in one go and then I time block it. So this looks like it's quite intense, but this takes me maybe half an hour every week, this bit, every fortnight, sorry, 15 minutes, 10 minutes in the morning. That's it. But that's because I'm, pra- I'm practiced at it, but it is really that quick. It really is that quick for me now. So it will take you a bit longer in the, in the, uh, in the beginning, but it will become much more easy as you go through. Any questions before I move on to our last little section? I know I've just brain dumped so much on you, but like I said, this is a bit more of a like lecture style one than, than interactive. Cause I want to just get as much over to you as possible. No. Okay, cool. We'll move on. So I say it's half time. It's a uh, half time in terms of mentally, um, no oranges, sadly, no orange slices, but a big scary question. What on your to-do list is keeping you up at night or what kind of task keeps you up at night? Just drop it in the chat and we'll kind of keep that in mind as we go through to the last part of this. My tea is cold. That was so gross. That was horrible. Um, anyone got anything that they want to share? I can't see. There we go. The chat has popped up again. The boring but important admin ones like legal contracts. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got some of those at the moment that I've just been putting off for so long. And I hate to say it has don't tell Rachel, but money stuff, account stuff, this stays between us. But yeah, no. Uh, forgetting the little things. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Lack of visibility. Yeah. So why I love all of this is because it really helps with the <laughs> thanks, Taz. It really helps with taking that mental load off. And actually something that I don't have on here, but I'm going to make a note right now to um to add in. Is something I've started using in the last few weeks and it is called the shutdown routine. So I'm just going to make a note to myself because that's the point of the shutdown routine. Um, okay. So shutdown routine consists of two parts. One part is a working memory document. So for me, it's my notes app. Um, and you just call it working memory. And the idea is there is no formatting, no organizing. It is just your, it is your brain dump for the entire day. And when you do it, you do not organize it in any way you just bam put it down carry on with what you're doing and it just helps you to get it out your shutdown routine is half an hour at the end of the day where you go through the working memory document and you make sure that anything that's on there is put to where it needs to be so it could be a task it could be a reminder these little things that we're talking about could be um small tasks that you do in the shutdown routine it might be loads of two second tasks like you know send this email reply to that whatsapp um, put this in the calendar, that sort of thing. And why I've been finding this super helpful is before I was like actually putting it into the calendar. And when you put it into the calendar, you're like, oh shit, I've got that thing to do next week. And I start thinking about that as well. And like everything gets on top of you. Whereas the working memory document means you just brain dump it and then you deal with it in one clear section at the end. Um, and I found that super, super helpful. And it means that those little things all get captured. But the key thing is that at the end of the day, you clear that working memory document so it's empty every single day. And it gives you that confidence that you haven't forgotten anything because you put everything into that document and then you spend that time at the end of the day putting everything where it needs to be and then you shut it down. And this is um, Cal Newport who wrote a book called Deep Work and loads of other things. He's got an amazing podcast called Deep Questions. I highly recommend if you're into this stuff because it's all about living and working deeply and how our work shouldn't come at the cost of our lives. So it really aligns with how I like to think. Actually, he's got a book called Slow Productivity coming out next year. And I was like, I've been talking about sustainable productivity for four years. He's clearly copied me, but you know. Um, so that is super helpful. I'm going to add that to this pr- this presentation because I think it really aligns with all of this, but it really helps with forgetting those that, that worry. Um, and he culminates it by shutting his laptop and saying shut down and it's like a mental this guy is a a georgetown computer science professor like he's super smart and it's all about using your brain in the right way and telling your brain shut down you've got that trigger that i've done everything i needed to do i've put everything where i needed to be i trust myself and then it's out of your brain so i found this so helpful this is only the last three weeks i've been doing this and i really 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 recommend it Okay, I'm going to keep going because I've now taken up like five minutes more of time <laughs> that I had. So um, I was going to say we were going to do a little bit of a breakout, but I think if also I feel like everyone's a bit like end of the week vibes anyway. So you probably want to keep yourselves to yourselves a little bit. So I've taken a few bits out of this because it's it 
like I said, this would have been an hour and a half session, but I've kept the really core thing in. And that's what I want you to keep in mind is this is the, the bit that I've left in is the really important thing. So sports has got it right. As every great athlete understands, the highest performance occurs when we balance work and sorry, I'm just got my face in the way work and effort with rest and renewal um i actually spoke to a, a an olympian and he was like our olympic athlete calendars are non-negotiable like no one can change them and yet we let people and this isn't just in work this is our outside of work time we let people just take our time willy-nilly and we really need to be much more you know protective over what we say is important for us but the most important thing is rest. And so I'm not just talking about your going to bed early, your weekends, your holidays, all of those are important, but actually this feels like I've kind of built up to it, but interlude, we, our core thing that we, we used to have an app. Um, and actually because I was finding it, that it was really running a tech business was really damaging my mental health. Um, we've pivoted from being an app to doing these workshops as our main thing, which I really enjoy doing and I get a lot of joy out of. Um, but the app was all about uh, taking breaks and so you can see I'm, I'm really living on what I what I believe here so taking breaks is a huge amount of science behind it and it's a really key tool because it enables all of the tools that we've just spoken about breaks enable all of them so if you want to feel calmer you can do some breathing and meditation if you want to feel more energized you can get up and move your body or stretch your desk stretch at your desk sorry if you want to feel more focused you can try journaling or doodling but it's not just about the best res- the end result the best breaks will always be the things that you enjoy doing. And again, just a bit of context and a bit of like evidence for you. Um, This is what started everything for me. So when I was um, at uni, you know, very, very newly visually impaired, trying to learn how to live and work with this disability, arguably one of the hardest places to work in the world (laughs) in terms of like the actual work and your mental health and wellbeing breaks were what did it for me and it took me a really long time to realize that's what it was so I was like pushing myself to the limit like I literally wouldn't be able to see and I would then take a nap and then I'd be like okay let's read some more Shakespeare and then I would do that again and then after a while and I mean a while like a year and a half I was like oh if I if I rest before I can't see I don't get to the point where I can't see wow so smart um got through that degree really just like on on survival mode but my master's degree which I did a couple of years later I was religious about breaks I took a two-hour lunch break every day and I know not everyone can do that but some people here can so I took a two-hour lunch break every day so that I was properly rested I went for a walk so I ate I cooked ate something healthy walked rested and I've never been so productive in my life I literally I finished my degree three weeks early and I went on holiday to Brazil so this is this is what I like a truly the science is behind it, but I've lived it as well. And this is from someone who is working with a disability as well. So it just shows you how important this is. So a huge amount of research on this um, and it's actually quite disparate, which I think is important. It, it's really saying that or how to take breaks, how long to take them, what to do on them is down to the individual. But what they do agree on is that taking breaks improves productivity and well-being at work and that breaks need to be regular to be effective. So, okay, we've literally got two, like we've got the half an hour of like catching up time at the end, but if people need to drop out, absolutely fine. We're wrapping up anyway. But if you want to stay, I've just got a few bits left. So this is your brain on breaks, a really interesting Microsoft uh, study. Again, the methodology, a little bit to be desired. It was um, a very small sample size, but I think it's an interesting indicator. So this is your brain on back-to-back Zoom calls. Again, shady from Microsoft. Why did they not use Teams? Rude. But back-to-back Zoom calls, half an hour with no breaks in between. Blue is good, red is bad. So (laughs) I think I know very clearly how it feels to be meeting brain three (laughs) like that. I feel like that's actually where I get my tension headaches as well as like here. Um, But then the second lot is your brain with 10 minute meditation breaks in between those half an hour meetings. And so a few things I think are super interesting. At a first glance, we can see great. You feel better when you take breaks. We can see that it's more blue. But if you look at this first brain and these are the same people and they knew what was happening. So that again, like with methodology. Um, So they knew what was happening. And I think we can see in the scientists. Yeah, I know. I know. Really, really interesting, Rachel. That's uh, Lauren. That's one of my, my things that's interesting here. So between three and four, I actually personally think so 
one of the things we were going to talk about here is how three is really bad and then four is better. I think it's because you're you you know that the meetings are going to be coming to an end. Like that relief is is almost there. That's how I feel personally, anyway. And I think that you feel worse in meeting brain one for when you have back to back meetings with no breaks than this one because you've got that pre stress. You know, you're like, oh, I've got two hours of meetings. That pre like Ugh, feeling. Whereas in this one, you're like, okay, I don't. I know that I've got breaks in between them, so it's a little bit. You know, it's a little bit less um, stressful. Lauren, who's in the chat, um, has got a PhD, so she's definitely going to be looking at this with a very scientific hat on. Um, but I do think, like I said, there's a lot to be um, delved into with this. But I think it's a really, really interesting starting point at thinking about how important brains are. Something I would love to see, I'm sure Lauren will think about this as well, is like, what does this look like when people get to self-select their breaks? So choosing things they really enjoy, because like meditation, for example, a lot of people find that quite stressful. So I think that would be a really interesting thing to look at as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, that'd be fascinating. Ah, see, I've, I've impressed a scientist. I'm happy with that. Okay, so break-taking best practice, according to a lot of um, the research I've read, planning your breaks in advance, going back to the time boxing uh, thing there, booking breaks into your work calendar. So this, if you work in a day job, requires a bit of conversation with your manager, but we do this in my day job and it helps so much because if someone is saying, I need 10 minutes between these meetings, they they want to bring their best version of themselves to you. So sometimes it will require a bit of back and forth, a bit of like, how can we make this work for both of us? But it is doable. It really is doable. Um, so yeah. Oh, no worries. Bye, Antonia. Um, and keeping it consistent. So whatever that looks like for you. So I've looked at a lot of the research and what there's, there's loads of different things. You may have heard of Ultradian rhythms, which is an hour and a half. Um, and then taking a break. Pomodoro is the like smaller blocks and five minute breaks, and then a bigger block at the end. There's loads of different things, but what it seems to say, the research seems to say is none of those are universal and so what that leads me to think is that it really is down to whatever you works for you so some people want to do a big chunk then take a break other people want to do um it by time like i do hour and then five minutes whatever whatever you do block it in communicate it keep it consistent okay we're almost done uh marginal gains i'm actually just going to leave these up for a second and let you screenshot them because they're all really self-explanatory but we don't have a huge amount of time so just some quick things like getting things the hardest and the most important thing done first, avoiding that kind of work that is work about work that, you know, you're just avoiding doing other things. Take a break instead. Go and do go and let your brain, um, you know, have some time off. Audit, audit, audit. All I mean by this is um, and I've just seen the typo there. I have a visual impairment. You have to forgive me on that. Um, keep looking at what you're doing and improving it and iterating it. Um, avoid busy work you've just done habit stack that's the other one I wanted to say if you're trying to build something new a new habit um, like time blocking you can stack it onto something you already do this is from James Clear's Atomic Habits so if you already um, read an article in the morning maybe that's something you like to do maybe you could do a time blocking before or after that so you stick it to something you already habitually do um, two minute rule in case no one's heard of this. Some people this works for, some people it doesn't. It doesn't work for me, which is why I thought I should include it because it might mean that I, I'm not just self-selecting things that work for me. So some people really find it helpful. If something comes in and it's going to take fewer than two minutes, just get it done. That works for some people. So it might work for you. Um, and then the last one that I think is uh, a little bit less self-explanatory. Multitasking is a software engineering term. It's not how our brains are built to work. So multitasking just is taking attention, it's taking um, effectiveness away from you. So monotasking, just picking one thing and sticking to it and using that working memory document, whether it's a, a notebook or your notes app or whatever, to just brain dump anything that comes out, put it down somewhere, carry on with what you're doing. Any questions on these ones? We'll have time for questions at the end, so don't worry. Okay, this is the most important part of this whole session. So you cannot control it all. There's a book called Stolen Focus, amazing book, I highly recommend. In it, Johan Hari talks about how basically the culmination that it comes to is that, yes, there's a lot of things we can do personally to have pay more attention to things, to work a bit better. But the technology that we use, and I really don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but this is just exactly true. I've, I work in tech, right? My day job is in tech. I've worked, I have my own tech company. I've designed a tech product. Technology is designed to steal your attention. Like Interlude, for example, our app, 
we deliberately designed it to keep you in to take your breaks but then get back out again but that was the design you know and that was just like a basic like startup app but big tech is designing their tools to take your attention because of ad revenue and things like that but that is now to the point where we're so used to it that our brain seeks out these distractions those dopamine hits that little red bubble that tells you that someone wants something from you and someone wants to talk to you bam 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 it's always searching for that dopamine hit and you know tiktok short memory span all those sorts of things that's why i'm so grateful that you've taken like such a big chunk out of your day to focus with me because we're not actually used to doing that anymore so i really recommend reading this book a because we need to spend more time reading <laughs> it's good for our brains but b because if you find these things hard and if you're beating yourself up that you are really struggling to focus, actually there's a big macro thing at play, which is the tech that we're using is has done this to our brains. And there's a lot of research on this on like how our brains are different now. So try not to beat yourself up too much. However, on the other hand, it's a fantastic book called 4,000 Weeks. This is the American one, Time Management for Mortals. The British title is 4,000 Weeks Time and How to Use It, which I think is way nicer. Um, but another thing that that, I think is really important to bear in mind is the efficiency trap. So Oliver Berkman, and he's got a fantastic newsletter called The Imperfectionist. He talks about the efficiency trap, which is the fallacy that by getting more done, we'll have more time. Not true. I mean, I'm sure all of us can think about when we're like, if I just get these 10 things done, then everything is finished. But like work begets more work. And I actually want, I used to work at a marketing agency and they used to say like, don't do work too quickly for clients because they'll just think that you can work really fast and give you more work. Like you have to do it at the, do it at a normal pace. And I think that's really stands in good stead. So something that I thought was quite revolutionary actually is Oliver Berkman suggested that we need to accept that the list is never done and we need to learn to live in the discomfort that the list is never done. And there are going to be some things that go into that delete box of our eyes and how matrix and they're just gone. And that is fine. And just focusing on the things that are important and get us to our goals, including the goals that are about like our friends, our family, our health, our wealth, all those things. So I think that's really important to bear in mind as well. These two things are things that are out of our control, but we need to recognize anyway. Okay, key takeaways. Proven ways to harness your productivity. They exist. But new habits are hard. You need to find what works for you. You need to be patient. And I would say also like have a lot of grace with yourself. Um, you need to be consistent. And you will see the benefit if you kind of bear these things in mind. So in the spirit of asking for help, which is going to be the next section where you can just ask me any questions, um, three things that you could do for me. So one is to recommend workshops. If you work in a company where you have um, budget for these sorts of things, I do much more in-depth versions of these. I do series. I do all these different things um, about uh, the power of breaks, about different parts of sustainable productivity, goal setting, all those sorts of things. Um, and I would love to come and work with your team because I think that I do this in a different way than most people do. And I would love people to be thinking in much more sustainable ways when it comes to productivity. So I will obviously give you a little a little uh, friends and family discount um, on that as well as a thank you. So spread the word. I've sent you my uh, my Instagram handles at the beginning, but this is the main one, joint interlude. So um, sharing on LinkedIn and Instagram. Like I said, I spend no money on marketing. So I really appreciate when people share feedback. And finally, rate this workshop. Next slide, please. This is the, um, the feedback form. I would really, 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 really appreciate if you gave me a little bit of feedback. It takes two minutes. I'll leave that up for a second, but the next bit is about questions. So I'll leave that up. But if anyone wants to stay for questions, the time is now. No worry, Maria. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, I'll leave this up for a second. And then the time is yours to ask any questions that you have. Right. I will leave that there. There we go. Right. No worry, Lauren. No worry, Lauren. God, my brain. No worries, Lauren. Um, here's my email as well in case you want to send me anything privately. But I will just stop sharing now. There we go. All right. No worries, Nicole. Thank you so much. Right. If there is anyone who has any questions, your time is now. I'm staying for 20 more minutes and then if, any, if, any, if everyone wants to leave, that's fine. I will go and take another painkiller. But if people want to ask questions, go for it. Um, Caitlin, the type form thing didn't, the link didn't work for me. I don't know if it worked for other people, but it didn't take me anywhere. It's okay. I, it might be, it might be that I've reached a limit on it, but that's fine. I will send it in an email. No worries. 
thank you there everyone um it did work earlier but i think it's one of i'm i'm on a free i'm on a free plan so it might be that it's reached its limit that some people have already it, it was just the the thing that i scanned that didn't take me it, right. i use the same one every time and it's never had that problem that's Thanks. so strange but thank you for letting me know i will send that around thank you matthew for let me know as well um cool any questions or also feedback in terms of like this I've tried this before and it and it didn't work like sharing experiences also also really important so if anyone's got anything they want to share rather than ask go for it thank you Robert anything anyone I'm just going to screenshot some of those points here so I can remember them Thank you, Karen. All right. Well, if no one's got any questions, that's absolutely fine. You've got all of my, um, I know I've, I just brain dumped so much on you. So it's absolutely fine if you want to go and like marinate a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, you can reach out to me anytime. I think a lot of the time you need to like practice these things a little bit first and then you'll have some questions. So you've got my email, you've got my socials, come and find me wherever you want. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate you giving up so much time on a Friday morning. Um, hopefully you can take a little bit of time today to let these things settle in, try out some new stuff. Like I said, little and often, don't go all whole hog at once, like change my life, December, like try one thing. Be like, maybe in December I'm in a to-do list, to-do table. Um, maybe this month you're going to Eisenhower. Whatever it is, just give it a go. Please let me know how you get on. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so glad you enjoyed it, Wendy. Thank you. Right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.